Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining with us at Exeter Bible Fellowship. We have uh, Mike Nelson as our speaker today and also some music uh, brought to you from the Nelsons. Uh, we have much to be thankful for despite the lockdown that continues. We've had some beautiful weather to enjoy recently. Uh, it's good to see some rain this past week, much needed. I'm sure the farmers are thankful. So uh, let's just open with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up and magnify and praise your holy name. We love you. We thank you for your faithful provision day after day. We thank you mostly for the salvation you have freely provided through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that each one watching this service uh, would feel uh, your presence, and may we be challenged and encouraged as we hear the message from your word. We know your word is living and active, and so allow help us to allow your Holy Spirit to uh, search us, and uh, may we be become uh, better equipped to serve you. And so we thank you for your goodness, and for what you will do through this message. Bless each one, we pray, that is uh, sharing with us in this, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we hope that you'll enjoy the service. Again, our speaker is Mike Nelson, and uh, we have some music as well uh, from the Nelson family before and after the service. So um, thank you again for joining, and enjoy the service.
Well, good morning and welcome to Exeter Bible Fellowship. Uh, so glad you could join in with us today, whether you're watching online or through the cable TV station. Uh, you know, it was the, probably the, one of the very first times I was uh, together um, uh, at the front here with um, Exeter Bible Fellowship that I, I shared a little bit about the ministry that uh, myself and my family are involved in through Gospel Express Ministries of Canada, which is a prison ministry that serves incarcerated men and women throughout Canada in provincial and federal facilities. And, and you know, for the last year or so, our ministry has been considerably uh, interrupted uh, with the with the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, access to our prisons has been has been cut off. We have not been able to get in. But, you know, the one thing that has been continuing to be able to get in is to our, our Bible study programs. Uh, at Gospel Express Ministry of Canada, we offer two Bible study programs. One is a study of the Book of Romans, uh, which is a five book series, which, um, you know, men and women can uh, can read the books and fill out the uh, uh, the work booklet. They, they get sent in for grading and then returned to them. It's a fabulous program that walks them through verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Romans. Um, the other one that we offer is a three book series called The Touch of His Hand, and it's a study of the Lord's Prayer. Again, uh, same format, three book series. They complete each book, uh, write out the booklet, send it in for grading, and then we return the graded uh, books to them. And when they complete um, either the five book series or the three book series, uh, we reward them with uh, an, an award book of their of their choice, which is a fabulous opportunity for them. Um, with the interruption of COVID, it's, uh, I was speaking to one of our chaplains in Atlantic Canada um, just in the last week or so, and for many, many, many months of this COVID, uh, they have had little or no access uh, to the inmates. In fact, one of them was saying that she hasn't seen, um, really had any face-to-face -face contact with those inmates for quite some time. So really, it's just the, the back and forth of these Bible study programs is really the only uh, impact that our Christian teaching is, is getting into them. I wanted to bring that up for the sole reason that uh, at each time this year, Gospel Express Ministries of Canada, um, we are donated a small package of land, 28, um, 28 acres that, that we called our, our cropping project. And what we do is we, we share crop that, that land and the proceeds from that um, fundraiser go to actually pay for the Bible studies, the Roman series and the touch of his hand, along with all of the, um, the costs of shipping them back and forth and mailing them back and forth to the inmates. So it's, it's a fabulous project. So I, I encourage you, if you're interested about that, um, if you would go to the Gospel Express Ministries of Canada webpage at gospelexpress.ca and go to the cropping page, you can find out more about that opportunity. Uh, at the very least, we encourage you to pray for that because every time we ship in boxes of, of, uh, of seminar booklets, of uh, Bible study booklets, um, you know, it's, it's just amazing that these men and women uh, can get up close and personal with the Word of God. And we know that God's word never returns void and it has the power to change lives. And that's that's kind of where we're going to go in the message today. But I wanted to give a, a quick update on that. And for those who are able, it would be uh, a, a blessing if you'd be able to help out in that endeavor. Um, but I'm going to start off here and just um, I had to go back and uh, it seems like it's forever been. It's only a month since I was in here. But at the end of April, um, I took a short pause uh, from the book of James um, to look at a couple of topics um, that I thought would help prepare us for this passage that we're going to look today. We're going to look at uh, James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. It's the faith without works is dead section. And the last time we looked in on God's word, um, I wanted to uh, really unpack what the, what the true meaning of the gospel was. And I think today's understanding and teaching of the gospel seems to have drifted a long way from that original teaching that Paul outlined of what the gospel meant. Uh, when he um, when uh, he um, uh, shared the, the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, um, you know, it, it is also vastly different than the message that that Peter and Paul preached um, the six times in the book of, uh, in the book of Acts. So the, the gospel message we're hearing today is very, very different from what Paul outlined and then what we saw Peter and Paul preach throughout the book of Acts. Um, the gospel message, quite simply, is centered on the life the death, the resurrection, and the lordship of Jesus Christ. And, and quite simply, the message could be, the gospel message could be summed up into four words. Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's, it's short, but it's sweet, and it's so powerful. And I think we unpack some of each of the, the meaning of those words last time. Um, last time, too, the second topic we looked at was how to be effective uh, uh, in our Christian life and witness. And uh, in that example, we looked at the life of Philip and his meeting um, with the Ethiopian eunuch along the way. And during our, our discussion in, in both those topics, we, you know, we looked at different terms that, 
that as Christians, we kind of we kind of threw out. We we looked at the word belief and we looked at the word faith and works, which we're going to look at um, more in depth today. We looked at justification and, and righteousness and uh, and the importance of understanding those terms and and letting God's word define what they mean rather than um, what we think they mean. Um, so today we're going to look more in depth on, on two, those two, faith and works. Um, and I think as we look at what James says about the relationship between faith and works, I think our eyes are going to be opened. But before we do, let's just uh, uh, going to open with a reading of, uh, of that portion of God's word in James chapter 2. And then I'll, I'll open with prayer. So go ahead and turn with me. Uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to James chapter 2, verses um, 14 to 26. And today I'm going to be reading from the, the English Standard Version. This is God's Word. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you say to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things they need for their body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown as foolish persons that faith apart from works is useless? Was Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac at the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same time, uh, sorry, in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just uh, I just thank you for your word. I thank you that we have the the, the privilege and the freedoms um, to to openly share your word uh, like this. So even though it's it's online, we still have the freedoms to do so. And uh, Father, I just long for the time very soon that we can be together again, opening God's word. So Holy Spirit, I just invite you here to um, to, to use me as a, as a vessel to to proclaim your word. Lord, I just ask that you prepare our hearts and minds. For this reading of the passage of the word and Lord thank you thank you that uh, that you've given us the gift of saving faith and Lord help us not um, just um, be hearers of the word like we read earlier in James but also be doers so Heavenly Father be with us now open our ears and hearts and minds for the message you have for us today in Jesus name we pray amen all right I am uh, excited to jump into this it's uh, it's been a, a little bit of a, 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 a time coming, but it, jumping right into it. I mean, James really hits us hard here, and, and he, he's talking about basically, you know, faith is a key doctrine in Christian life. You know, this it starts um, all the way through Scripture, and, and James being one of the earliest books written is, uh, is, is kind of the, um, uh, the, the, one of the only readings that that early church, the, the scattered church, had was was James' letter to those to those uh, uh, believing believing Christians spread around. And you know, as other um, writers came along, and and we 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 can dive into a little bit more what faith is. We we learned a whole lot about the doctrine of faith. And uh, quite simply, it starts out that you know sinners are saved by faith. And uh, we know that Paul uh, in Ephesians two eight. And nine, he, he said, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. God's grace to us, he's been given. He gave us faith. And it's not of our own doing, but it's a gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. Should boast. So sinners are saved by faith. And Ephesians is quite clear about that. Um, second part of that is in, in the believers, we must walk by faith. And again, Paul to the church in Corinth says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. 
Hebrews 11 also shares with it that, that faith is impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it goes, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that seek him. Um, Romans, again, tells us that whatever we do apart from faith is sin. It says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So it's such a huge topic. But what we can say for sure in this, in this, you know, even these, uh, these very short verses that we're reading, that, that sinners are saved by faith, that we must walk by faith that it's impossible to please God without faith. And whatever we do apart from faith is a sin. So um, someone who is, someone also once said, they said that faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but in, in obeying in spite of consequence. And sometimes that's it. It's, you know, faith is obeying in spite of the consequences. And that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in right now, wondering what should we do? How should we respond to many of these restrictions as far as worshiping uh, and gathering and not forsaking the gathering of believers? So faith is obeying in spite of consequences. Hebrews 11, it, we read a long list of men and women who acted on God's word no matter what price they had to pay. You know, faith is not a feeling um, you know, it, it's, it's a gift we've received by grace. Faith is confidence that God's word is true and conviction that acting on God's will will bring his blessing. Two points there. Faith is confidence that God's word is true and conviction, feeling that conviction that acting on that word will bring blessing. You know, in this paragraph that we've, uh, that we've read and that we're going to unpack a little bit further, James discusses the relationship between faith and works. And this is an important discussion. You know, there's, there's true faith. And whenever there's true faith, there's also counterfeit faith. And that's just a reality of the world. There's, there's so many counterfeits out there. The only way to know the fakes are to, to know the truth. So if we're wrong in our understanding of faith, if we buy into that counterfeit faith, we can jeopardize our eternal salvation and our eternal security. It, it's not a perfect analogy. But I want to pause for a minute and just ask, I want to ask one question. Um, it's a question I ask a lot when I, it's actually, this is part of a, a teaching that we do in our, in our prison ministry. And I, I quite often um, will ask the men and women in prison this question. Has anyone ever jumped out of an airplane while it's in flight? And, you know, I get various answers because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different people in there and many, many military and servicemen uh, have actually done that as a, as a living. And, you know, Many, many people have jumped out of planes, and, and some people have jumped out because they had no other choice. They, they were basically jump uh, and live or stay and crash to your death, and I get it. I understand why people would choose to jump out of a plane in that case, but the ones I don't quite understand is the ones who decide to jump out of a perfectly good airworthy aircraft just for fun and thrills, and I've never understood that. I do have a, a good friend that has actually just done that. In fact, I don't know the exact number of times that he's jumped out of the plane, but I think it's closing, closing in on almost 100 times that he has jumped out of a plane. And now, what is it that gives the fun seekers the confidence that they will land safely? I mean, they must have some sort of confidence or, or faith, you might say, that as soon as they jump out of that plane, things are going to be okay. You know, what is it that gives those on a disabled plane uh, the same confidence that jumping out is a better option than, than staying in. And the answer I'm given in either example, especially when I talk to my friend, is what gives you the confidence? And they simply say, the parachute. They put their faith in the parachute. You know, I still have a problem with this. You know, that, that parachute, um, there's a lot of variables that go into whether that parachute is, is going to save your life or, or not. And I said, to them, you know, all the parachutes look the same on the outside, but it's what's inside and how they're packed that saves your life. You know, a parachute that's not genuine is simply a backpack, and that won't save your life. I don't know anyone who's jumped out of a plane with a backpack and that has saved their life. So in this study uh, that we're going to look at, James, we're going to look at three different parachutes or three different types of faith that, um, that James explores in this passage. Because only one of those um, uh, types of faith 
uh, are true and will save you, and the other one and the other two are counterfeit. So let's um, kind of kind of jump into that. Um, you know, there is there is faith, and what kind of faith really saves a person is a, is a good question we want to we want to look at when we read into this. Now, the the other question I want to look at as we go through chapter two, uh, the second part of chapter two is: Is it necessary to perform good works to be saved, and what's that relationship? Third question that we might kind of look at as going through is: How can a person tell whether or not he is exercising true saving faith? You know, James answers these questions by explaining to us that there's three kinds of faith, and only one of which is the saving faith. So go with me to uh, James chapter 2. We're going to look at the first three, um, sorry, four, uh, three, first three verses in that passage we read, which is uh, 14 to 17. Um, and in this section, um, quite simply, we're going to look at what we title dead faith. And even in the early church, there were those who claimed they have saving faith, but they did not possess salvation. And that's what dead faith is. Those who claim they have faith, but did not possess salvation. You know, Jesus warned in Matthew 7, verses 21, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. So people with dead faith substitute deeds or actions, uh, words, sorry, for deeds and actions. They can talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They know all the right words to say, they can pray eloquently, and they can even quote the right verses from the Bible, but their walk does not measure up to their talk. They think that their words are as good as their works, and simply, they're, they're just quite wrong. So James gives a, a, um, an, an example, an illustration in these verses, 14 to 17. Uh, a poor believer came into a fellowship who was poorly clothed and in need of, need of food, and that person with dead faith noticed the visitor and saw his needs, but did not do anything to meet their needs. All he was, all he did is say a few religious words. You know, but the visitor, after those words, went away just as hungry and as naked as he came in. Food and clothing are basic needs that every human being has, whether he's saved or unsaved. As believers, we have an obligation to meet those needs of people, no matter what they might be. Galatians, Galatians 6.10 talks about that. It says, so then... As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and to especially those who are of the faithful, the household of faith. God tells us to take care of those needs as we see them, the opportunities that are around them, especially within the household of faith. Again, we're reminded in Matthew 25 when Jesus is teaching about the final judgment. In verse 40 of Matthew 25, he reminds us how, how the king will respond to our good works. In verse 40, it says, and the king will answer them, truly, truly, I say to you, as you did it to the least of one of my brothers, you did it to me. Just a reminder, as, as we respond to the needs that are presented before us, if we if we act on them and not just, just uh, uh, talk about them, um, like this example, um, God will reward those who take care of the least of these. So uh, to a person in need, um, to help a person in need is an expression of love and, and, and faith by works and love. In Galatians 5, 6 talks about that. For in Christ, Jesus neither, sorry, Galatians 5 and 6. For in Christ, Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So to help a person in need is an expression of love and faith works by love. And that's the, the whole idea, the difference between um, uh, what makes faith dead or not. And apostle, uh, the Apostle John emphasized the same point, um, the aspect of good works. In 1 John 3, 17 and 18, he says, but if any of you has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love the word love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So again, um, we're talking about not just loving in word or talk, but actually doing deeds and truth. Um, the example again is the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Each had religious training. They knew the words, they knew the talk, but neither of them paused to assist the dying man at the side of the road. we we'll read that in Luke, Luke chapter 10. Each of them would defend his faith, yet neither one of them demonstrated that, that their faith um, had loving words, works. 
Um, the question um, in James 2.14, uh, he, says, he says this, can that kind of faith or can that faith save him? And I think it might be, if we were to rewrite that where it says, can that faith save him? We might also say, can that kind of faith save him? So what kind? The kind of faith that is never seen in practical works. And the answer is no. Any declaration of faith that does not result in a changed life and good works, it must be a false declaration. You know, intellectual assent, you know, understanding or agreeing uh, with a set of Christian teachings is incomplete faith. True faith transforms our conduct as well as our thoughts and words. If our lives remains unchanged, we don't genuinely believe the truths we came to we, we claim to believe. It's one thing to think it, it's the other thing to do it. James 2.17 describes that kind of faith as dead faith. Verse 17 says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The, uh, the great theologian John Calvin wrote this, it is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. The, the word alone in James 2.17 in there, it simply means by itself. True saving faith can never be by itself. It always brings life. It always produces good works. You know, the person with dead faith only has an intellectual experience. In, in his mind, he knows the doctrine of salvation, but he has never submitted himself to God and trusted Christ for salvation. He knows right, uh, the right words, uh, but he does not back up his words with works. Faith in Christ brings life, eternal life, as we read in John 3, 16. And where there is life, there must be growth and fruit. Uh, that's just, that, that's, we can see that and observe that in nature. If there's no growth, there's no, there's no life, there's no fruit. Three times in this paragraph, actually, when we look at it, James warns us that faith without works is dead. Um, look at uh, verse 17. It says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And verse 20, it says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And in verse 26, it says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. You know, uh, we need to be aware of mere intellectual faith. And, and so many times it's, it's, we can study this and pour over it and do devotions and memorize it. And it gets up here, but it never comes down here. And so no man can come to Christ by faith and remain the same. It needs to go from here to here. First John 5, 12 says, whoever has the son of life, sorry, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Dead faith is not saving faith. Dead faith is counterfeit faith, and it lulls us, um, and, it, and it lulls the person into a false confidence of eternal life. And so many times I've seen it, and you know, maybe I've been there in my own life where I, I've been very confident in my, in my head knowledge or understanding of Scripture, but then I realize I'm not acting on it. I'm not doing it. And the same thing with faith. Counterfeit faith lulls the person into a false confidence, uh, confidence of eternal life. Let's look at the second one. We're going to move to the second one. I'm going to move a little bit quickly through these, but the second example that, um, that James gives us is uh, we see in verses 18 and 19. We'll call this one demonic faith. And, um, you know, James, I think, wanted to shock um, his complacent readers, so he used demons as illustration. You know, I, I went to um, one of the resources to, you know, try and get a definition for demon, and basically, Demons are fallen angels, as it is outlined in Revelations 12 and 9. And, it, it, you know, Revelations 12 and 9 tells us that, um, you know, they're, the great dragon was thrown down, an ancient serpent who was called the devil Satan, the deceiver of the world. And it says he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So these are fallen angels. And, um, you know, Satan's fall from heaven is symbolically described in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. You know, when he fell, Satan took some of the angels with him. In fact, a third of them, according to Revelations uh, 12. So, um, you know, it also mentions that, uh, you know, demons are fallen angels who, along with Satan, chose to rebel against God. So, so 
James is pulling out the punches. He, he's starting to compare um, the faith of, of demons. So why does James talk about the faith of demons? Well, you know, when our Lord, um, Jesus Christ, was ministering on earth, um, he often cast out, cast out demons. And, and the readers of the time would have been familiar with the either firsthand observances of this or, or hearing through, through stories uh, of, of Jesus casting out demons. Um, not only did Jesus cast out demons, but he gave his, uh, the, the disciples the power to cast out demons as well. Paul, Paul often um, confronted demonic forces in his ministries, and we see that in Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians uh, 6, 10 to 20. He admonished the early Christians to claim God's protection and defeat the spiritual forces of wickedness. You know, it comes to, uh, as a shock to people and, and maybe perhaps the readers of the time that demons have faith. Um, what do they, what do demons believe? Well, for, it's, it's all kinds of things. For one thing, they believe in the existence of God. So demons actually believe much more than, than many of the uh, agnostics or atheists would around us today. You know, demons believe in the existence of God. They're neither atheists nor agnostics. They believe in the deity of Christ. Whenever they met Christ on earth, we can see this through various uh, various passages, um, they bore witness to his sonship. And we see that in Mark 3, verses 11 to 12, it says, And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Demons, um, not only that, but they also believed in the existence of a place of punishment. Uh, in the story of Jesus healing the demonic man, we read in Luke 8.31, uh, and they, the, the demons, begged him not to command them to depart to the abyss. And the abyss is what we, I believe, we read about in, in Revelations 9 and 20 as the, as the place of confinement for Satan and his messengers. The, the demons, of course, would have known well about this place of confinement, and they didn't want to go there. Demons also recognized that Jesus Christ as judge, as we see in Mark 5, 1 to 13, um, some other things, demons also submitted to the power of his word. And so it's a bit of a shock, but, but you know, James in here does talk about the faith of the demons. And, um, you know, I don't know if you can put yourself in the shoes of that, that first audience that read the, the letter. And when they read verse 19, they would have said, you believe that God is one and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You know, for the for the nation of Israel and for these these Jewish converts, since the beginning uh, of um, the time of the Exodus, this has been a daily affirmation in the life of, the, of a godly Jew. I mean, from Deuteronomy 6, we, we hear the, um, the Shema, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And uh, so that's the, that's the, the same uh, mantra, the same uh, confession that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that, the, that the Lord is one. You know, they would hear James um, in this letter and they'd hear him say that the demons believe as much as you do. In fact, they believe so much that they even shudder or, or tremble. So the man with dead faith was touched with his intellect, but the demonic faith, those who have uh, demonic faith are also touched in their emotions. They believe and they tremble and they tremble. So believe and tremble alone, however, will not save you. A person can be enlightened in his mind and even stirred in his heart, and be lost forever. True saving faith involves something more, something that can be seen and recognized, and that's a changed life. And James challenges the readers in verse 18 to do that. He says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So how could a person show his faith without works? Can, it, can a dead sinner perform good works? Impossible. When you trust Christ, we are as Ephesians 2.10 tells us, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were created in his workmanship for good works. You know, being a Christian involves trusting Christ and living for Christ. You receive the life and then you reveal the life. Faith is that, it, faith that is barren is not saving faith. Go a little bit further in uh, James chapter two, verse twenty. Uh, in the in the King James, it says it reads, um, "But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead?" 
Now, the Greek word there for dead um, is translated in dead in James uh, 2.20. It carries the meanings of a, a barren uh, or idle, like money drawing no interest. Is it, It's really not good for much. Other translations, uh, English translations, like the ESV that I read out of earlier, um, it, it translates the word as uh, the word dead as useless, and others translate the word as, as worthless. So it, it, it's, it's basically that this type of faith is, is good for nothing. It's good for no eternal value. You know, James introduced us to two kinds of faith that can never save the sinner. Dead faith, intellect alone, and the demonic faith, which is the intellect and emotions. He closes the sections by describing the only kind of faith that can save the sinner, which is dynamic faith. And we're going to look at that next. So dynamic faith, uh, faith is we're going to look at verses 20 down to 26. Dynamic faith is a faith that is real, faith that has power, faith that results in a changed life. You know, James uh, describes this true saving faith. Uh, in this section. To begin with, dynamic saving faith is based on God's word, and that's so important, and we've looked at this in, in earlier sections of, of, uh, uh, of James. You know, we receive our spiritual rebirth through God's word. Uh, James 1.18 says, of his own, he will be brought forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. You know, a couple of verses down after that in verses um, in 21, it says we, we, uh, we see we receive the word and that is able to save our souls. Um, 121 says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. You know, Paul, too, in his letter to the Romans in chapter 10, uh, when he's teaching on salvation for everyone, tells us so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You know, James uses Abraham and Rahab, Rahab as, as illustrations in this passage, um, uh, illustrations of dynamic saving faith, uh, since both of them heard and received the message of God through his word. You know, faith is as only as good as its object. For example, go back to the parachute. You know, to put your faith in a parachute only makes sense if what's inside the pack can actually save your life. So faith is only as good as its object. Picture the man in the jungle who bows down before an idol of stone or wood and, or something else and, and trusts it to help him, but receives no help. No matter how much faith that person may generate, it, it, if it's not directed to the right object, it accomplishes nothing. You know, I believe may be the testimony of many sincere people. But the big question is this, in whom do you believe? In what do you put your faith? Uh, what do you believe? We are not saved by faith in faith. We are saved by faith in Christ revealed through his word. And that's the powerful part of this dynamic faith. Dynamic faith is based on God's word and it involves the whole person. Death, death, dead faith touches only the intellect. Demonic faith involves the, the mind and emotions, but dynamic faith involves the will. The whole person plays a part in true saving faith, the mind, the emotions, and the will. The mind understands the truth, the heart desires the truth, and the will causes us to actually act upon the truth. You know, the men and women of faith that are um, named in, in Hebrews 11 were people of action. You know, God spoke and they obeyed. Again, faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but faith is obeying in spite of consequence. True saving faith leads to action. Dynamic faith is not intellectual contemplation or emotional um, consternation. It, it leads to obedience on the part of will. And this obedience is not an isolated event. It continues throughout the whole life. It leads to works. You know, many different kinds of works are named throughout the New Testament. You know, you have the works of the law that we talk about in Galatian, which relates the sinner's attempt to please God by obeying the law of Moses. Of course, it's impossible for a sinner to be saved through works of the law. Um, the other type of uh, works that's named is the works of the flesh. And we look at, again, in Galatians, are done by unsaved people who live for the things of the old nature. We also see um, other things like the, the wicked works in Colossians and dead works in Hebrews. 
um, just as a to, to list four different types of, of works there. Where there is dynamic faith, saving faith, you will always find good works. James goes on to illustrate um, his doctrine in the lives of two well-known Bible persons. We look at Abraham and we look at Rahab in this section. And you could not find two uh, more different people. Um, Abraham was a Jew, Rahab a Gentile. Abraham was a godly man. Rahab was a sinful woman, a harlot. Abraham was the friend of God, while Rahab belonged to the enemies of God. You know, what did they have in common? Well, they both exercised saving faith in God. God called Abraham out of Ur of Chaldees to lead him into Canaan and to make out of him the great nation of Israel. It was through Israel that God would bring the Savior into the world. Abraham's salvation experience is recorded in, in Genesis 15. It, it, at night, God showed his servant the stars and gave him a promise. So shall thy seed be. Like basically saying, look at the stars. Your, your descendants, the number of descendants you'll have will be like these stars. How did God respond? Or how did Abraham respond? Uh, Genesis 15, 6 tells us this. He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. It's quite simply, it was, a, it was a saving faith. Abraham believed in the Lord. You know, the word counted in that passage um, is legal or a financial term. It means to put to one's account. So as a sinner, Abraham's spiritual bank book was empty. Uh, he was bankrupt, but he trusted God and put God's righteous, and God put his righteousness on Abraham's account. Nothing Abraham did except for have faith. Abraham trusted and God credited his account. Abraham did not work for this righteousness. He received it as a gift from God. He was declared righteous by faith. He was justified by faith. And we can read about that in Romans chapter 4. Justification is an important doctrine in the Bible. Justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner right or righteous based on not his own works, but on Christ's finished work on the cross. It's not a process, it's simply an act. It's not something that the sinner does, it's something God does for the sinner when he trusts in Christ. It's a once and for all end, event, it, it never changes. The justified person has a changed life and obeys God's will. His faith is demonstrated by his works. You know, James used a, another event in Abraham's life, an event that took place many years after this conversion that we just talked about. The, the event is the offering up of Isaac on the altar that we read in Genesis chapter 22. Abraham was not saved by obeying God's difficult command. His obedience was proved that he already was saved. You know, and we see what James uh, says here in, in uh, verse 22. It says, you see that faith was active long along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. There's a perfect relationship between faith and works. As someone has expressed it, Abraham was not saved by faith plus works, but by a faith that works. You know, how Abraham, um, how was Abraham justified by works? Uh, he, when he, uh, how was Abraham justified by works when he had already been justified by faith? By faith, he was justified before God and his righteousness declared. But by works, he was justified before men and his righteousness was demonstrated. See the difference there? You know, justified by faith, it's all God. He declared us righteous. But justified by works, demonstrated his righteousness before man. It, it, it is true that no humans actually saw Abraham put his son on the altar. But the inspired record in Genesis 22 enables us to see the event and witness Abraham's faith demonstrated by his works. You know, dynamic faith obeys God and proves itself in daily life and works. You know, sadly, that's not always the case, though. It's, it's not always evident in the lives of professing Christians today. And it wasn't uh, always evident in the, the day, in the lives of the early Christians either. You know, in, in Paul's letter to Titus in, um, in chapter 116, he says, they, the believers, profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient unfit for any good work. That's, that's pretty strong language to talk about those Christians who profess the faith, but don't actually act on it. Now, Paul admonishes or encourages us 
a little bit later in chapter three of Titus in, in verse eight, he, he, he encourages us to devote ourselves to good work. He says, the saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. James' second illustration in this passage here is, is looking at Rahab. And I, I think in the interest of time, we're not going to dive too deeply into the life of Ab, uh, Rahab. Um, and I'm going to leave that for you to explore. But it's, it's an exciting story. Um, but it's also one of the Bible's greatest examples of saving faith. And Rahab's mentioned it in the Hebrews chapter. So Rahab heard of the word and knew that her city was condemned. This truth affected her and the fellow citizens so that their hearts melted within them. Rahab responded with her mind and her emotions, but also she responded with her will. She actually did something about it. She risked her own life to protect the Jewish spies. She further risked her life by sharing the good news of deliverance with family members. You know, Rahab could have had dead faith, a mere intellectual experience, or she could have been had that demonic faith, which is a, a mind enlightenment, but also her emotions stirred. But she exercised dynamic faith. Her mind knew the truth. Her heart was stirred by the truth, and her will acted on the truth. She proved her faith by works. You know, James 2 emphasizes that the mature Christian practices truth. He does not merely hold to ancient doctrines. Uh, he practices those doctrines in his everyday life. His faith is not the dead faith of the intellectuals or the mnemonic faith of the, the fallen spirits. It is the dynamic faith of men like Abraham and women like Rahab. Faith that changes a life and goes to work for God. It's important that each professing Christian examine his own heart and life and make sure that he possesses true saving dynamic faith. You know, in, in 2 Corinthians 13, Paul, he calls us, he calls us to examine ourselves to see whether you are in faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? You know, Satan is the great deceiver. One of his devices is imitation. If he can convince a person that counterfeit faith is true faith, he has that person in his power. We talked about dead faith. We talked about demonic faith. And we talked about dynamic faith. Three types of faith. Two of them are counterfeit. One of them will save your soul. You know, the friend I mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, the one who likes jumping on a planes, you know, he would probably agree that like faith, Parachutes will only benefit you if you do one thing. Romans 13, uh, 14 gives us a bit of a hint. Uh, Paul tells us, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for um, the book of James. I thank you for your word that we can possess it. I thank you for laying out clearly um, dead faith and the perils of it, demonic faith and the perils of it. And, and what we need to do to hold on to dynamic faith, not just intellect, not just emotion, but acting on the will. Heavenly Father, I just pray as we examine ourselves and we examine what true faith is, that we realize that we need to respond to that with, with, uh, with, with good works. We need to respond to that which is in us and let people see it on the outside. So Heavenly Father, this week as we go from here, uh, I pray that each person will will um, uh, take hold of God's word and, and have it pressed upon their heart and look for an opportunity this day to a neighbor, to a friend, to a colleague, to, to reach out in a very practical way and demonstrate how we might serve other people, how might we love other people, how our good works may draw others to you. So Heavenly Father, be with us now. Thank you for this time. Until we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen.